This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Welcome to the Gutsy Health Podcast. I'm Tristan and this is... Janique and we're the Ronies. We refer to ourselves as the hippie Ronies because we're we're pretty extreme. Um, but yeah, this is, um, this is a podcast where we talk about um, health and culture and nutrition and holistic nutrition, basically. And taking back your power. Yes. This is about empowerment first and foremost. Absolutely. Um, so in this podcast uh, today, what are we talking about, Tristan? We are talking about the healing pyramid. Yes, the healing. Right? Yes, it is. Good. <laughs> um, and and why the healing? Why the healing pyramid? Right? Like, how did we come up with this healing pyramid? We're also going to talk a little bit about um, culture, um, food culture, uh, health culture, medical culture, um, uh, culture around food addiction. Basically, how we have. Mm completely normalized food addiction. And we don't even recognize that. I mean, from like sending your children to school and then being rewarded for reading a book with candy to going to karate and giving, getting candy there. Um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Can you tell these are real life examples yeah. that we experience ourselves? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like daily. But before we jump into that, you might be wondering what is the healing pyramid? What is the healing pyramid? Okay. So, um, so, uh, if you haven't listened to our last podcast, or I guess it was our first podcast that we ever recorded, um, we we kind of give you guys the story on how we created our Prova Health Clinic, where we do hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy, we do ozone therapy, we do a lot of nutrition counseling, uh, blood work, and um, basically create these holistic healing plans for our clients. Um, but uh, what what would happen a lot is we'd have these clients come that were really sick and we would do a hair DNA analysis and we would give them a food plan and they, everyone wanted to jump to supplements and treatments and they, they wanted to throw their money at stuff. Basically it was, what is the least amount of effort I can put in to get the maximum amount of return? Exactly. And and so, I, and I kept trying to explain to people, I'm like, we have to get the nutrition down. You can't repair a house without material. So if you're not getting the nutrition in and you're not giving your body the building blocks to heal itself, you're going to get in a hyperbaric chamber and your healing is going to be minimal and you're going to be wasting your time and you're going to be wasting your money and your energy. We need to get the nutrition down. And so, um, bad, I re- bad health is not an inconvenience that gets in the way of your life. Bad health is your life, right? Yes. Your health is everything in your life. So it's not just a piece that has to be dealt with. It should be the foundation. Well, and and how many of our our patients or clients actually say that managing their health is like a part-time or full-time job? Oh yeah, full-time job at least half the time when you see people. And a lot of people have spent like $50,000, $60,000. Like some people are in the hundred thousands when really we try to make it so basic and say, listen, nutrition, let's get down to the basics. Like you have three opportunities every day to either build your body up or break it down. And how you do that is by what you put on your plate. It's like a bank account, right? Every time you eat, you're either putting money into your food health bank account or you're taking money out of it. Exactly. And if you keep taking money out, eventually you're going to find yourself in crippling debt. And the problem with debt is that it accrues interest, right? The yes. same thing happens with your health. Once it reaches a certain problematic point, it continues to multiply the issues that you experience. Mm-hmm. And that makes it harder and harder for you to dig your way back up to good health again. Yes. So I want, I'm going to keep bringing up the house analogy, how I, and this is how I explain the basics of nutrition and healing the body to all my clients when they come in to do hair DNA analyses. So your body is like a house, okay? Constantly under construction. A triangle shaped house. Why a triangle shaped? Because, because it's, it's the, the healing, healing triangle. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no homes that are triangular are functional. So, so. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt would like to have a word uh, with you about that. Weren't those grave sites though? Yeah. They weren't really home. It and, was a house to house a dead body. But they're still standing thousands of years later. Let's talk about traditional shaped homes <laughs> <laughs> with roofs and straight walls. Um, so so I tell them all my clients, your, your, your body is like a house constantly under construction. And there are a few things in here at play. So um, 
you have your contractors and your builders who are putting the blocks together. You have the bricks, you have the cement, you have the excavators that are getting rid of all the rubble and debris and decay. You have your paint, you have everything that you need to constantly do repairs or remodels on your home. Okay. Now, what happens when your house is starting to break down and you have your contractors, but you have no material to rebuild your home? Bad things. What happens? The house continues to break down, right? But not only that, but your contractors start to get really bored because now not only do you not have materials, you're not feeding them. You're not paying them. They're hanging out doing nothing. And they're like, well, peace out. I'm going to go on vacation. So now you have no, you have no materials. You have no contractors. You have no excavators. Um, your house is going to start looking like a 100 year old house, a 200 year old house. It's going to start breaking down and failing on you. Um, so when it comes to the body, I always say the cement is like your vitamins and your minerals. The, the bricks are your amino acids. Your contractors is the energy metabolism. Every single cell has mitochondria that creates energy. If you are, and you also have the hormones that provoke energy metabolism. And so if you don't have hormones to help your body make energy, Nothing is happening. There's no movement. There's no rebuilding and repairing. And the one thing the body is really good at doing is rebuilding and repairing itself when the materials are there, right? So um, so hopefully, and again, I'm going to come back to that analogy a lot, you guys. So, um, so hopefully that makes sense. But we started create, so I, I came up with this idea with the healing pyramid, the nutrition pyramid of, um, of, really showing people why nutrition is key. We need those building blocks. And then we can start implementing treatments once the building blocks are in place. Yeah, it really is about timing, right? People want to jump straight to the top of the pyramid where the treatments and the right. magic pills are. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why those things tend not to work very well. And it's because they're not being done in the right order. Or, or they work for a short amount of time. And then, then they stop working and then you go back to your doctor and they put you on a different supplement or a different medication. And then they work for a little bit and then they stop working. Um, they're, they're doing something, but it's, it's not long-term. It's, it's not addressing the root of the problem, the exactly. foundation of the house. And therefore it's not a permanent solution. Exactly. So, um, so so the very bottom, and we're going to put a link in this podcast that you can go and actually see the healing pyramid, but the very bottom, it's, it's like a three tier pyramid. The, the bottom is the nutrition. We need those building blocks. We also need to make sure that you're not eating food that is acting like a hammer to your walls in that house. Right? So for instance, sugar is extremely inflammatory sugar and in our like housing little analogy is like giving someone a jackhammer and t or giving a toddler a jackhammer and saying, go to town, like go and destroy and like break everything. Right now, now to be clear, when we talk about sugar, we're not talking about it in the most general sense because sugar or carbohydrates, right. Is a very important fuel source for the body. We need glucose in order to do right. everything that we do. It's the source of the glucose, right? When we talk about sugar, we're talking about refined quality and quantity. Mm -hmm. The the quality refers to where does it come from? Yeah. Like like Janique was saying, the refined sugars, the the white stuff mm -hmm. that we're so used to thinking about when we think of sugar. Exactly. That is the jackhammer to the wall of your house. Exactly. Even, and bread too. Like yep. processed bread just gets metabolized back into sugar, which creates inflammation. Not to mention that most of our bread is made with wheat drenched in glyphosate, which is actually, um, is uh, the world health organization, I think says it's, it's probably a carcinogen. And yeah, so when it, you it use a words probable like that, carcinogen. yeah, it's, and when they say it's a probable carcinogen, you can bet your bottom dollar that it is actually a carcinogen. And, and in case you are one of those skeptics that thinks that's just fear mongering, because there are a lot of things on the, the who list of probable carcinogens that are maybe not as bad as they make it sound. But in this case, there are actual lawsuits going up against mm -hmm. Bayer, which recently bought Monsanto for specifically exposure to glyphosate. And these people are winning their lawsuits against a gigantic multinational corporation. 
And it's not just because the world is going to hell in a handbasket. There's, mm-hmm. there's actual evidence supporting that. And there's even evidence that Monsanto knew about the carcinogenic effects of glyphosate and didn't tell anybody. That's exactly. That's pretty damning. Yes. And but I guess that's kind of sidetracking. Yeah, we're side. I know. Sorry, guys. Oops. So going back to the bread and the carcinogens, like, again, those are just jackhammers in this house that needs repair. Um, same thing goes with dairy. We're actually going to do a massive podcast, well, a podcast on dairy and going to why dairy can be really inflammatory. Um, and there is a difference here as well. Uh, dairy doesn't necessarily have to be a problem for everybody, but once again, it comes down to a couple of things. First is the source. You can't just go to the nearest grocery store and buy the cheapest gallon of milk they've got. That's going to be a problem for you. Yeah. Uh, the only really safe sources of dairy, if you actually start looking into the kind of the chemical makeup of what happens when they process the dairy, it needs to be raw and it needs to come from pastured animals. Exactly. And, um, but, but again, like there are some people that even if it was raw dairy, like Mm -hmm. their body still can't handle that. And that's because of the other really important factor, which is once again, timing right? Mm-hmm. You need to first build up your foundation so that yeah. your body is able to utilize that dairy in a healthy way. Exactly. Otherwise you're going to run into problems exactly. like trying to lift a 300 pound weight your first time to the gym. Yes. You're going to have a bad time. You, you need to start with the 10 pounds, right? And the 10 pounds in this um, scenario are vegetables, not dairy, not yep. dairy. Exactly. <laughs> not processed foods, not sugar. Um, we're starting with the basics, the least inflammatory foods out there. Um, we need to get the inflammation down so the body can start healing itself again. And so that's why I said in the beginning, you have three opportunities a day to either build your body up or break it down. So how are you going to choose that? And, and again, but, but then people get overwhelmed. They're like, well, where do we start? You know? And so, so that's why, um, that's why one, you talk to people that can counsel you through that. And then you get on a program that hand holds you through that as well. Like people that know what they're talking about. And, um, and, there, and we could go back and forth and, and we'll talk in other podcasts too on the culture around these different diets, right? Um, keto, paleo, um, Atkins, uh, what, what other ones are really Yeah, one, one of the issues people run into is they try to find the one true diet, right? right. It's like a religion search except for with food. Mm-hmm. And oh, veganism. What, what almost always ends up happening is that you become a bit of a zealot and you go... 1000% in on at least your belief, although mm. your adherence probably isn't that great. And then you wonder why it's not working very well. Right. Um, you'll have a few of the the really big people at the center of the religious food movement who are getting great results, but everybody else seems to struggle and they're not sure why. Right. And it's because the the particular diet you follow is secondary to the principles underlying general good health. There, once again, is a time and a place for all these different types of diets, but it has to be done with purpose and with good timing. Otherwise, you're, you're just not going to see the results that you want. You know, and, and the research shows us some pretty obvious things. Like, for instance, we know what are the most inflammatory foods. So when someone is looking to heal through nutrition, we cut out those inflammatory foods according to research. And then research also shows that people that eat a mostly plant-based diet get a lot of healing and a lot of repair and feel amazing. So there's, there's these key factors, right? Decrease the processed foods, the sugar, increase your vegetable intake, increase your clean proteins intake and your healthy fats, and you will get improvement. So we don't have to have these labels of paleo and veganism. It's, 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 it goes back to the core, right? The, what the research is saying, what, what the common denominator is with all of these diets. And I, I think it might be fair to say that the, the concept can be summarized in the, the word whole foods. I guess that's whole two foods. words. But, yeah. but if you're eating whole foods, meaning things that don't need ingredients to create, right? right? It's going to be the things you buy at the store and it is the thing that you're going to eat. It's yeah. the fruits, it's the vegetables, it's the, even the, the meats, right? They are complete foods on their own and they don't need 15 different ingredients. They don't even have a label for the most part because exactly. they are what they are. Exactly. 
the things that your great great grandparents probably ate because that's all that was available from the farms Absolutely. that were in their town. Exactly. And so when, when we can find these common denominators through research and um, basically what the research shows us, that's when we start to get healing. That's when the body can start to put those materials back to start healing up the body. And then we start looking at phase two or three of their healing protocol, which is um, supplementation and treatments. Sometimes we do recommend supplementation for the nutrition because you're not what you eat. You are what you absorb. And so when people are having massive gut dysfunction, sometimes you need to hire out contractors, right? Going back to our house analogy, you have to hire out contractors to help uh, repair everything and put it back together again. And so um, I love when my, when my clients come to us, I, I love putting them on digestive enzymes because it's such a game changer for them. And um, it helps take the strain off of their own digestive tracts and systems and really helps them utilize um, or maximize um, their absorption and utilization of those vegetables and fiber and fruits and proteins and all that stuff. And in those cases, really, hopefully in all cases, our goal would be to make it a temporary remedy because we would hope that what we're Mm -hmm. doing is rebuilding the system from the ground up, getting that strong foundation for the house so that you're not in need of all these extra contractors, so to speak, all the time. But it can take time, especially if you think of, for a lot of us, it's been decades of poor eating habits, poor lifestyle habits, and poor health. abusing your body Mm -hmm. with all these really inflammatory foods. Or even if we're trying to do well, if we haven't been successful at it and we've been chronically ill for years and years, we can't just expect that changing our diet for a few weeks is going to turn things around dramatically. Exactly. It's not impossible. It's a a process. It takes literally months. Yeah. I mean, uh, it might be fair to say that for every year you've had bad health habits, you need at least a month, month to, to reverse that. I just made that up. There's no evidence for that, but <laughs> it sounds good to me. So let's right. go with it. It's, it's, um, it, it. It does kind of fit our experience too, though, does. that yeah. people who have been sick for a long time need more time to heal. Exactly. Which means that it requires those dreadful things, patience and faith. Exactly. Um, Kind of going back to when I was diagnosed with Graves' disease, if you listen to our first podcast, um, we found pretty, we found out that I had Graves' disease pretty early on in the game. And so that's why, like, so I had Graves' disease for about five months. Um, And then it took me about six months to heal that up. Now, there are people that have had Graves' disease for years they're not going to heal up in six months. It's not going to happen. It might take them two, three, four years, but it's not, but it's going to be a process. They're going to start feeling better and better and better. Um, it's not going to be more like a, I, they're implementing all these things. And then at the four year mark, they're a brand new person. Right. So, um, so there is definitely a timeline depending on how much damage control we are doing within the body. And one of the other things that happens is that when someone has a symptom show up and they go see their doctor, the doctor gives them a medication Mm -hmm. and that medication does not address the underlying issue, but it does mask the symptom. So it's like taking your car in for a repair and all the doctor's doing or all the repairman is doing is switching off the check engine light. Mm -hmm. So there's still problems with the engine, but the light is off now. Right. And so you may not be noticing the effects of your ill health, but that doesn't mean that your health is good. Mm -hmm. And so once again, when you actually start making the foundational lifestyle changes that are going to lead to true good health down the line, it can take more time because your body has been in an unhealthy environment, an unhealthy state of being for so long. Exactly. So, um, so that's the first tier, nutrition. Nutrition is super important. Let's talk about the second tier, which is movement and stress. Which one should we hit first? Those are both so important. I, I want to hit stress first because right. I think stress is so massive. We are, we're really stressed out society and it doesn't serve us at all. Like there, so research shows that, uh, some of them, okay. If you're familiar with epigenetics and methylation processes, um, basically methylation helps your body perform all of its functions beautifully. You mess up your methylation processes and you start getting disease and you start getting all kinds of issues arthritis, brain frog, brain, brain frog. frogs, brain frogs, brain frog. <laughs> so, so 
So one, so research shows that a lack of sleep and stress is actually one of the worst things you can do for your methylation processes. So are you, are you talking about the Bruce Lipton stuff right now? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just talking about okay. research that I, that I've referred to in my classes and lectures and stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but we- the Bruce Lipton stuff absolutely plays a role in stress. All right. And we can talk about that if we want. Well, we'll see. Maybe we'll see. if we have time later, we can go into that. But, yeah. but it's this idea that what happens on a cellular level tends to ripple out to the rest of our world and mm-hmm. our cellular state of being is affected by our stress levels. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a Chinese medicine parable and, and you're going to be like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Cause we just spoke about nutrition and massive depth, but there's this Chinese parable and I hope I get it right, but it says rather eat bad food with the right mentality or the right mindset than the right food with the wrong mindset, because that is way more damaging. And, um, and I think we have actually, we, we see that a lot where, um, where people are eating perfectly and yet they are still really sick, but they're also so stressed out. Um, stress is very inflammatory for the body. I mean, you think of the chemical and hormonal processes that have to come into play with stress. I mean, first your adrenals have to pump out loads of cortisol, which over a period of time is very inflammatory for the body. And not only that, but it takes your body away from a rest and digest state. Um, how can you heal and repair if you're not resting, if you're not digesting, if you're not absorbing, if you're not able to reset your body? Exactly. And so in our society, I think we almost glorify being busy, being being um, this go, go, go getter. And we don't, we don't give enough credit for keeping still and meditating and taking time out for ourselves. I, I don't think there's any almost about it. I, our society absolutely kind of idolizes the people who are going 24 hours a day Mm -hmm. and we cover up our fatigue with huge amounts of caffeine and uh, other stimulants. And then at night, the only way that we can get to sleep is by taking really strong sleeping pills and sedatives. And um, it's a, it's a roller coaster for our body. Exactly. Not the good kind. Exactly. So we're, we're messing up our hormone system. We're creating all this inflammation all of this decay starts to happen starting on a DNA level, you know? And so once we start messing with our DNA, with our methylation, it's just downhill from there. So nutrition is important. Stress is, I, I don't know if some people would say is equally as important, if not more important. Um, but, but for me, um, nutrition comes first, stress comes second. And I think it's important to note that we don't have to choose Right. Right. No one is putting a gun to your head and saying, all right, you can either be stressed out and eat True. well, or you can eat McDonald's and just chill. And meditate and do right? yoga. I, I think if you were forced <laughs> with that decision, you would have a bad outcome no matter what. So, mm-hmm. so luckily the two actually tend to go hand in hand. In fact, there's a, a, a term for the type of food that we really recommend people eat and they call it slow food right? It, kind of in contrast to the fast food that has taken over our society. Slow food requires you to slow down because yeah. you can't just go buy it pre-made and then enjoy it on the run. You have mm-hmm. to buy it and then clean it and cut it up and then and throw it in the pan. actually enjoy and, the process. Which isn't to say that it has it. to take hours every time you make it, but it does, it's a, it is a process, which means that eating is more than just what you put into your mouth. It's, Mm -hmm. it's your culture around food. I guess it's probably time to talk about culture because you mentioned that at the beginning. And I think let's talk about it at the end. Let's, let's briefly touch up on our last few things with the the pyramid and then let's talk about culture. You you got it. We'll come back to that, but this is a really good example of where culture comes into it. It's, Mm -hmm. it's how we relate to food, not just what type of food we're eating. So, so we, we have nutrition as the base and then our second, um, what is it? A rung? What, what are we calling this? Well, it's a pyramid, so we should probably call it the, the third second. floor. No, no, no. We're, we're still on the second floor. <laughs> oh, we're still on the second floor. Because the oh. second floor is stress and movement. Okay? Oh, right. They're, they're, we haven't talked about movement. Yes. Movement oh, is so important. I'm getting ahead of us. Yeah, you are. <laughs> ah, so excited. <laughs> so, so the reason why movement is so key is because, um, 
it really, you know, th- there's a reason why we do oxygen therapies in our clinic, right? And oh, yeah. with movement, you are getting tons of oxygen deep into your cells, into your muscles. Um, it helps to build and repair your body, um, but stronger even. And we're not just talking movement, like a brisk walk. Like you have to take your body to the edge because that is where massive amounts of healing and repair and growth comes into play. So we just talked about how terrible stress is and now we have to almost take it back because there are different types of stress and the type of stress that is good for you is called eustress, E-U stress. Good stress, true stress. This is what we're talking about here. When you exercise, you are creating a phenomenon called hormesis. And what that is, is it is stress on your body that your body then responds to by becoming stronger, Mm -hmm. right? Every time you lift a weight, if it's hard for you, your body's going to say, wow, that was really hard. We should probably prepare so that next time that big weight comes along, we're ready for it. Ready. And Mm -hmm. therefore your muscles kind of get bigger and stronger. And then Mm -hmm. you put heavier and heavier weight and everyone knows how that process works, but it applies in many different ways in our body, not just to the size of our muscles. Exactly. And, um, also, especially because again, cancer, right? I did a lot of cancer research back in the day, but, um, they showed that people with breast cancer and colon cancer who, um, after doing treatments, they're in remission, Um, people that exercised, I think it was 30 minutes a day, five days a week, their remission rates were cut in half, which is actually way more successful than any of the cancer drugs out there. Yeah. Um, and so like those studies were extremely profound in the medical community. They, they, they started realizing just how important exercise is. And it goes back to getting high amounts of oxygen in your body, getting good blood flow, getting that good stress on your body that helps your body get stronger, endures longer, right? Like it actually, yeah, it stimulates your body mm -hmm. to produce new blood vessels so that you can get blood throughout your body more efficiently. I mean, the the benefits of exercise, I don't know if anyone's going to argue with us on this, Mm -hmm. but they are almost limitless. Also like the way your body transfers nutrients to every cell and tissue and organ in the body is through the blood system. So when you're exercising, Exercising, you are amping up that delivery mechanism to all the cells in your body, all the tissues in your body. But not only that, there is an organ in your body that thrives off of movement, and that is your brain. Like literally, what? when yeah, you know this, you're a psychologist. <laughs> but um, but when you move, like your brain stimulates all kinds of happy hormones um, that I can't remember all of them. You probably know all of them, Tristan. Well, one of the most important is called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, neurotropic factor. And what does that do? And that is essentially like a super growth hormone for your brain that just makes everything better. Right. Memory, your cognition, the whole thing. I mean, you want to prevent Alzheimer's, you want to exercise, right? That's, that's you, lit, like you, basically you, you're making your brain younger. Exactly. Like you're, you're slowing down the, de- the deterioration of your brain through movement, through exercise. Um, because again, like your brain, um, your brain controls the body, but then the body stimulates the brain. It's this kind of like feedback loop from receptors to whatever. Right. And so you want to make sure that that feedback loop from muscles to brain and brain to muscles is constantly going and constantly being practiced over and over and over again. You want to utilize your brain through the movement of your body. Not only that, but constant education too, right? It helps with memory. It helps with new neuron uh, production. Um, but specifically with movement, your brain was designed around movement. It was, it, it's beautifully integrated to have movement throughout the body. If you want a really deep dive into that brain movement connection, there's an awesome book that we listened to Spark. an audiobook back in the day, Spark oh by my gosh, incredible. John Rady, I believe. He's a medical doctor actually, and he's just done some just fantastic research on it, but mm-hmm. he just goes into 
a lot of really interesting depth on all the connections between your brain and getting exercise. And if you want to get motivated to start running and right. exercising again, that book is, I just cannot Incredible. recommend it highly enough. It's been out for a few years now. It's like 2010 oh. or 11. We listened to that, I think back in 2010, yeah. maybe 11. I don't know, but, um, but, but it's still just one of the best books out there for that topic. Well, and so. not just like cardio, but like weight training, high intensity interval training. They all stimulate the brain in different ways. And so is one superior to the other? No, absolutely not. We should be doing all of them. Like you should be doing bits of cardio. You should be doing bits of weight training. Um, however, um, if you are someone that's listening to us and you have severe health issues where your body cannot sustain movement just yet, then this is something that you might have to come back to later once we started healing and repairing the house a little bit more. Well, so you, you start where you are able to start, right? right? For you, that might mean mm -hmm. walking around the house one right. extra time a day. A lot of people that are actually very sick, um, they, they do sauna. And sauna literally, it, it, it's kind of the lazy version of exercise. It's like, yeah, it's like a cardiovascular exercise, exactly. but just mostly your cardiovascular system. And benefits. so if someone out there is really sick and they're listening to us taking a hot bath, if you don't have a sauna, like do a hot bath, try and soak in it for about 20 minutes. You want to get sweating, right? We want to lubricate this, your joints and your, your blood vessels. And we want to get your heart rate up a little bit. So it's pumping more oxygen to your tissues. It's pumping more nutrition and nutrients and vitamins and minerals to your cells. Um, so, so if you can't exercise, there is sauna there's brisk walks. There's, there's other things you can be doing. Mm -hmm. One um, of the, one of the places where people tend to fail when it comes to making these types of lifestyle changes we're talking about, or that they get overwhelmed because they think they need to go from a zero to a 10 yeah. right off the bat. No. And I can promise you no matter how difficult it is for you to move, there is probably something you mm -hmm. can do that will be more than you did yesterday. Totally. Even if that is just sitting up one more time today. Yes. And that might feel silly. It might feel like that's such a minuscule, mm -hmm. tiny thing, but it is something. And what it does more importantly than anything else is it starts to build momentum in your favor. Right. I, I go, I'll go back to my experience with Graves' disease. Um, I remember, oh man, I was so sick. And um, I remember going for a run down the road. It, it was like a 10 minute run and coming back. And the next day I was as sick as a dog. I, I got strep throat and I was out for about 10 days. And so I realized that was way too much energy exertion for my body. So then um, when I spoke with my doctor, she said, make sure you're not raising your heart rate. You're not exercising, but they, that didn't sound right to me. And now I'm not telling people with Graves disease that they should follow in my footsteps, <laughs> but I'm just sharing my experience that didn't resonate with me because I remember thinking I have all this cortisol burning in my bloodstream right now. I need to burn it off somehow. So what I did was I got five pound weights and for about five minutes a day, I did like bicep curls and tricep. Do they, do they call it tricep curls? Or um, it? I worked tricep out my tricep extensions. Thank you. Thank you, you got it. Uh, and then I would do like squats and it, it was like 10 squats or something and like 10 bicep curls. And then it went from 10 to 15 and then it went from 15 to 20. And that's like, and my workout routine was literally like five to 10 minutes long because that's all I could do. But I felt so much better doing it. And so you need to one, understand what your body can and cannot handle. And then two, like try, try something, try, you know, listen, like intuitively, what do you think your body can do? Don't try and punish it with exercising massive, like, like start off slow and then break the exercise to your body gently. Um, be like, we need to nurture our bodies and take cues from our bodies. I think that's, that's an, a, an issue with our culture too, is we are so disconnected from the signals that our body tries to tell us mm. so disconnected. We don't listen to the signals of breakdown. We just pop ibuprofen. Right. I mean, mm. like, and, and we're talking like these subtle signals, like how many people have brain fog, how many people are tired and they caffeinate? Like how many people, like if you're listening to us, did you drink caffeine today? 
It's okay if you did. We're not judging. No, we're not judging. But how <laughs> how dependent are you on caffeine? Like, what is your relationship with caffeine? Like, why are we trying to force our bodies? Why are we not listening to these cues? Right? Like, um, because well, no. your body should be able to make energy where you're not exhausted in the mornings. You're not exhausted throughout the day. Where did that dysfunction come from? Listen to those cues. Meditate on them. And if you are ready to make the jump, then then jump and change some lifestyle habits that you have. Right? On a similar note, how many of us out here are weekend warriors where we will go mm. months without <laughs> exercising and then all of a sudden we do a 50 mile hike, Yeah, right? Or we play the world's most intense hurting. game of uh, basketball. basketball. <laughs> and of course right. we end up injuring ourselves and feeling awful. And then mm-hmm. we don't do anything again for three more months. Right. Um, I mean, we've, we've been there ourselves and we've known people who they would literally do nothing for a month. And then they would go do CrossFit twice in a day. And then they would be laid out for two days straight because their body hurts so much. It's, it's, that is not good stress. So that is bad stress. So you stress, right? That's what you called it. You stress. You stress is good stress. You stress is good stress. Distress is bad stress. Exactly. So there's healthy stress and not healthy stress. So be mindful. When we're talking, when, when dealing with your stress demons. Okay. Shall we talk about the third tier the th- of the, the, the healing third pyramid? floor of our healing pyramid hotel? Yes. <laughs> so the third floor is treatments and supplementation and um, medications. And now if you are a listener and you've been to a doctor recently and you had a health issue, they jumped straight to this tier of medication, right? They didn't talk about stress. Oh, unless you had a really good doctor that's like, let's talk about stress, right? Let's talk about nutrition. Or if um, you were in an emergency situation, so, which is where medications mostly belong. Right. But most doctors, and I mean, I mean, naturopaths are even guilty of this. DOs are guilty of this. Like alternative health practitioners are guilty of this, where a, a patient will go into their office and they are sold hundreds of dollars of supplements, maybe even thousands. And, and that is where everyone is starting or they're being put on medication or they're being put on a treatment plan and, um, and they are not getting long-term results. So then they go to another doctor and another doctor puts them on their treatment plan or their supplements or their medication and they don't get help. And then they, they go in the medical America round again to another doctor. And it's the same old thing. How many doctors talk about those first two tiers of the healing pyramid? And so here's my theory, and I can't say this is true, but doctors don't want to talk about nutrition because it is hard. Well, and they don't know anything about it. They weren't trained on it and they haven't done the research well, on it. Well, so. even those that are trained on it, right? They, they say, fix your diet, right? Or they... You know, it's it's really hard to coach people through these lifestyle changes. So doctors don't even want to talk about it. They just want to put them on supplementation and be done. Right. Yeah, they don't have the time they to don't have the time. support someone through a lifestyle no. change. That's that's really it's not their job. We shouldn't expect them to do that. But we do expect right. them to take full control of our health and that's why it's a problem. That's why yes, exactly. But you talk about, you know, jumping to the the top tier of the pyramid going straight to supplementation. We're guilty of that ourselves. We run a retail supplement shop. We do. And people come in all the time and they say, Hey, here's my symptom. What do you got? And we list off three or four things that they can choose from. That's true. And then they go on their way and we never see them again. So we are not exempt from this uh, societal sin. That's absolutely true. But what they're not coming in and asking us is how do I get to the root cause cause of this? And when people ask us that, we say, "Come on back to my office." Well, sometimes Let's even without have a that, talk. you sometimes sometimes we'll try to get video of uh, Errol, that's Janique's dad, when he's pulling people into the back of the clinic because they'll come in just looking for some essential oil, and he's <laughs> like, "Hang on, you got to come see this," and he literally drags <laughs> them on this tour of our clinic, and yep. it's awesome. And sometimes it really does work, and people end up becoming some of our best clients. That's true, um, but. Uh, but yeah, you know, sometimes all that people want is a quick Band-Aid. Exactly. And, and, and we'll provide that, you know. Because our Band-Aids are relatively safe. Exactly. And, but if people want to get to the root cause, you bet your, I, I can't swear on our podcast. Patootie. You, you bet your patootie that we <laughs> are going to bend over backwards to help you find answers and help you change your lifestyle and support you through that. Um, but again, if you want a band aid and you want a supplement or an essential oil or an herb, like, yeah, we'll, we'll list off 10 for you. So 
At what point is it appropriate then for someone to start looking at supplements and medications and treatments? How do, you, how do you know when you've given mm. enough time to the, the two lower floors of this pyramid? That's a great question. It's, it's so individualized. Like for instance, like our Lyme patients, you know, sometimes nutrition is not going to hit it. So we have to put them on pretty hectic protocols where we are weeding what we call weed and feed, right? Mm. Where we're using herbals, um, and enzymes to break the biofilm of the Lyme bacteria. And then we're testing to see if that's successful. And if it's successful, we take them uh, to the next uh, phase of treatment plans, which is hyperbaric and then ozone because we want to make sure. But, but again, again, it's, it's so different. And like I said in the beginning, if my clients are not absorbing their nutrients, if they're not absorbing their food, if they're making all these lifestyle changes and they're still not breaking it down, they're gassy, they're bloated, they're uncomfortable eating their food. That's when I say, okay, we need to support your nutrition mm-hmm. through some supplementation, which is digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid or something else. Yeah. And now that you mention it, even when we have people come in who were going straight into a treatment protocol, mm-hmm. the ones who tend to have success with it, or they're more likely to have success are the ones who are at the same time making those lifestyle changes yes particularly with the nutrition mm-hmm. so and they're managing their stress they're doing their homework they 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 even ask like there's those people that ask what books do you recommend and i always take them to biology of belief and the untethered soul biology of belief is bruce lipton which mm-hmm. came up earlier in this episode and yeah. he he talks a lot about the interplay between our kind of our inner world and our outer world mm-hmm. yeah so maybe that's a good transition and then, from the, uh, the pyramid, right? To talk about... Have we covered everything else that we wanted to? I don't know. Have we? <laughs> let's well, you're the sorry, one guys. We're, we're consulting our little bullet points here. Um, let's, let's start talking about the biology of belief. All or, right. Um, but basically, and this, this kind of encompasses everything, right? Where um, the cells in your body um, are constantly in communication with the environment. And so... The nutri- your nutrition is part of your environment. Your stress is part of your environment. The way you interact with um, relationships is part of your environment. And your cells are going to react according to those stressors, those good stressors and those bad stressors. So if you're stressing your body and your soul basically with bad food, bad relationships, um, bad stress, you are going to experience dis-ease. But if you incorporate healing foods, non-inflammatory foods, if you are creating boundaries in your life with those toxic people and you are seeking out people that are like-minded like you, that lift you up, that make you feel good, um, if you are controlling your stress, you're sleeping, you're putting yourself first, you're reprogramming your negative tapes, your cells will respond accordingly. Your DNA will start recording, will respond accordingly. And, um, and so- I think that uh, that that metaphor you just used, the tapes, is extremely important here. Mm-hmm. And we've we've talked about this in different metaphors, which is the stories that we tell ourselves, right? The stories that we're given and the stories that we tell ourselves. If you tell yourself a disempowering story, yeah. then you will be powerless. There is no question about that. Exactly. But if you tell yourself a story that says, I have control here, that my decisions matter on exactly. a moment to moment basis, then your decisions will matter, which means that you do have some power in your life. And that can be a terrifying thing because it means that you're responsible for the outcomes you experience, but it can also be the single most empowering thing that you ever come across in your life. Yes. You get to have a say in what happens to you. And I'm saying that as a person who got stage four cancer in my early Mm thirties. All right. How old are you? 33. I was 33 years old when I got diagnosed. All right. So I had a say and, and I fully accept that responsibility But that means I also get to take some credit for how well I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And it's it's kind of fun because we even have some of our clients when they are uh, doing their treatment protocols in the chamber or in the ozone sauna, the hocket, we have them listen to affirmations. And so so they, they really are. They're trying to take this holistic approach to healing everything from the ground up, from chemistry to emotions to spirituality, um, all of it. And so, um, so yeah, 
So, so yeah. So before you accuse us of blaming people for their own illnesses, uh, that's not what we're trying to say. But what but we are trying to say is that you are more in control than you realize. That's right. You, there is no point in looking backward and placing blame at this moment in your life, but there is a lot of value to be had in looking forward yep. and seeing what you can do. Yep. Taking your power back. Like you, you are the captain of this ship basically not your doctors, not some, not us even, right? Like it's you, you are the driving force behind this. You are the one making these changes. It's, it's all you. Okay. Um, can we briefly, before we wrap up, can we talk about culture or should we leave that for another? No, episode? I think we have to, we've teased it so much. I know. <laughs> it would be unfair to leave it unsaid um, at this point. We so, still have a little bit of time. So I just want to briefly talk about, because now we're, we're done talking about the healing pyramid, but I want to talk about why implementing this healing pyramid is so hard. It sounds easy. Like we talk about it, it's like, yeah, just eat better food. It is really hard because we live in a culture that completely normalizes our food addictions, our sugar addictions. Um, it, it like from, and, and this starts from young. I mean, think about it. You send your kids off to school, right? Like from like, let's even say preschool and they come home with a bag of candy because they did something right. Or it was someone's or just birthday because they showed up or really. just because they showed <laughs> up or, you know, you, you, they, they go to karate and they get candy for just showing up to karate. Right. Um, we reward ourselves with candy. We reward ourselves with dessert. Um, and it is completely normalized now. I, and and I know people, I mean, this has happened to us where we're at a family uh, get together and everyone's eating f- ice cream. And my, my daughter, Satori, who's two, she wants ice cream. And I, and I tell her, no, sweetie, you didn't eat your vegetables. And I'm sorry. Like, that's our rule. And then I'm shamed by my family members. They're like, oh, come on, just let her eat the ice cream. This is part of the culture, right? Where, where we are unsupportive of people implementing healthy lifestyle changes because the culture, again, I I keep saying this over and over, we've completely normalized candy. And and sugar is the most addicting substance on the planet. And potentially one of the most deadly when you get down to it. It creates so many problems in our bodies. Exactly. It's, It's like slowly poisoning yourself over decades. It's not just diabetes, folks. It's mm-hmm. so much more that sugar does to us. It deteriorates our brains. It deteriorates the our liver. joints. It, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, yeah, you don't need us to start going off about sugar. You already exactly. know about it. But, but yet we, I mean, you, you turn around and we're handing it to k- children left, right, and center. Um, so we need to recognize that the reason why these changes are so hard is because our culture has set it up that way. And we need to recognize that in our daily lives and our relationships with our, our, again, with our schools, our karate places, our friends, when we go out to eat, like it is so embedded in our culture and even in like the commercials on TV. Right. And if once we can recognize this, then we can start implementing those changes. Which isn't to say that just because you recognize it, suddenly it's easy, right? It's right. It can be an extremely lonely road to make these types of lifestyle changes, especially if everyone around you, particularly your family, yeah. thinks that you're crazy and yeah. they want to bring you back, right? They don't do it intentionally, but they drag you down because they don't want you on a different mm-hmm. level from then. Well, and, and I know throughout my entire life, I've... I've eaten really well compared to most people. I mean, we've eaten really well in the past three years, but I remember when, when people would ask me if I wanted to eat something, I'm like, no, I'm okay. And they're like, you don't need to lose weight. You can eat that. And for mm-hmm. me, I'm like, and, and, and I'm a pretty skinny person. And so for me, I'm like, no, this isn't about weight. Eating well is not weight. It's not how I look. It's about how I feel. And, um, And, but again, it's that culture. It's that reaction of why are you eating vegetables? You don't need to lose weight. No, you need to eat vegetables to stay alive. You need to eat vegetables to live a good, like vibrant life where I can keep up with my kids without having back pain and joint pain and brain fog. Right. I want to be an involved parent. That's why I eat vegetables. Not because I want to lose weight because I want to function. Yeah. One of the kind of chidings that you'll hear when you start doing this is when people say, oh, well, moderation on all things, right? As if Mm -hmm. to say that we should only 
moderate how healthy we eat. And right. that's the best thing. Another now, cultural slap in the face, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you want average health, then go ahead and have an average diet. But mm-hmm. the average health state in this country is absolutely terrible and not one that I would choose for myself. Exactly. And so even just with the examples that we've given you, can you see how eating well is so shamed and yet no one bats an eyelid when it comes to candy, when it comes to processed food, when it comes to pizza, when it comes to hot dogs, no one bats an eyelid. And so we need to reveal this culture for what it is and push back against it because you deserve a healthy, vibrant life. And so now I realize that we're we're asking you to walk a very fine line because on the one hand, we talk about the importance of eating really, really healthy. And on the other hand, we talk about the importance of not getting too stressed out. And exactly. we fully realize that eating really, really healthy can cause you a fair amount of stress. So that's where it, it takes a lot of work. It takes Change a lot of slow. time. It takes a lot of self patience and self-love to exactly. recognize that you're not going to be perfect and that's okay. We don't expect perfection of ourselves. We don't expect it of you. And we and you shouldn't don't expect it of you to expect of yourself. Exactly. Sorry. Did I just, and you just stole I, I my saw the punch beautiful line. line that was going to go up on the front page of our website. Oh my gosh. I'm uh, sorry. Dang so, it. <laughs> so, but, but really, and that, that's what our community that we're trying to create is all about. It's about creating a culture that supports good health, but in a very gentle and loving way. In a healthy way too. This is not going to be a shame-based culture where everyone is beating each other up because they messed up and ate a ho-ho yesterday. Are those even a thing still? I don't even know what a ho-ho is. It's because you're not American. Well, I I technically am now. (laughs) Well... Well, luckily for you, you didn't grow up with ho-hos because I did and they're terrible for you. What but are they? uh, uh cream filled chocolate. Like a Twinkie? Kind of like a Twinkie. Okay, I know what Twinkies they're, are. I've seen them in movies. They're from the same whatever company uh gotcha. hostess. Anyway, oh, okay. uh what I was saying is we're not gonna beat each other up for eating ho-hos, right? We're going to support each other, we're going to help each other do better. And we're going to help each other recognize that this is part of the journey, yes. that it isn't about being perfect from here on out forever. It's yep. about working towards perfection, exactly. working towards good health. And we're never going to achieve perfection. And that is totally fine because the closer we get, the better we feel and the more we're able to do and the more we enjoy our lives. Exactly. And that's really what this is about is enjoying our lives, feeling empowered to make things better for ourselves and for our families. And exactly. And I, and I want to leave off, like, let's close up this episode by saying that eating well is not boring. I love food. I love tasty food and I love healthy food and healthy food can be so tasty guys. Absolutely like, amazing. So good. Like I, oh my gosh, I, uh, now I like all this, <laughs> like food porn is going through my head. I'm like, let's start talking about flavors. We're not going to get into that, but you don't have to like create a lifestyle where you're completely miserable. Food should be enjoyed. That's a healthy relationship. Like food is pleasurable and you can eat well and have it be pleasurable too. So we just have to differentiate between addiction to food mm -hmm. and enjoyment of food. Yeah. Because a lot of people right now are suffering from food addiction, Addiction. which is where they just crave sugars and nasty salty Mm -hmm. foods not good salty foods, but nasty salty foods and, yeah. you know, terrible fats and all that. And those cravings, that's the addiction. That is an enjoyment of food. Once you've broken those addictions, you can then enjoy healthy food yeah. and you will enjoy it far more than you ever liked that Burger King Whopper or totally. whatever nasty McDonald thing that okay. you think you like. Exactly. So thanks you guys for listening. Hopefully that um, enlightens you more on what a healing journey can look like through a healing pyramid model. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks. All right. We'll see you next time. 